All right, so we are recording. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and hit start webinar and we'll start um, broadcasting live on Facebook. Okay. Um, so Jamil, you can, you know, say hello and everything and then just ask people to put in the chat where they're from and then we'll get started from there. So. All right. Hello, guys. There we go. All right. Hello. Hello, folks. Um, if you can just put in the chat where you guys are from. Welcome to our webinar. Um, we'll start in a couple minutes here. Just want to make sure that everybody can get on and everything. But once again, just let us know where you're coming from in the chat, um, just location and name. And we'll get started in a bit. All right, so we have Catherine from Seattle, Washington. Hello, Catherine. Oh, uh, we've got Ken from Manatee County. And we've got a Haley from Texas. All right, wow, we've got a, a whole bunch of folks. <laughs> um, we've got my uh, Marilee, Marilee from Ventura, California. Brianna, Aaron, wow. Ooh, lots of folks coming on. But welcome, welcome everybody. Okay, we've got Carlos from Mexico. Also Paulo from Mexico. Meg Malone from Chicago. Uh, Naomi Martinez from Mexico. Jacob G from New Jersey. So welcome all of you guys. All right, man. All right. So many folks. <laughs> you barely keep up. Is this usual? <laughs> uh, depends. It depends. Sometimes we have a lot of folks come on and, and sometimes, oh. you know, the chat is a little more quiet. Okay. But I'm, I'm really happy that we've got so many folks uh, logging on with us. So thank you. Thank you All for right. being here. Pressure here. <laughs> <laughs> Try to move this All light. We've got Angela from Maryland. Hello. Hi, Ariel. <laughs> got Tanisha from District Heights, Maryland. <laughs> Someone's very excited to, to see you, Olivia. Uh, oh, Katrina Dutton. <laughs> yes, yes, I, Katrina worked with us on the project, so that's really exciting. Oh, awesome. Well, yeah, I'm sure she'll love to hear all about you guys it's working <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I mean and she knows a lot about it too i've kept her in the loop i was wondering if i knew ever, anybody else but i don't actually think i recognize any of the other names here yeah, well that's all right you know curious souls and mm -hmm. people who want to support so all right we're gonna get started in just a second hello <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. High school? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, they're going to make a project from my presentation. Oh, heavens. That's quite. <laughs> that's You're quite, very popular. A lot of pressure. I actually, I mean, uh, uh, to the folks at that high school, I have a, um, uh, a project from my PhD that we've just in, turned into a virtual laboratory, if that's of any interest um, mm. to folks. I'm happy to share. Um, I don't know if um, I, oh gosh, I don't think I have my email address in the, but I can put it at the end of the presentation. Hold on. Yeah, if you want, and if we don't have, we can just um, plop it in the chat as well so people have access to okay. it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think I can put it in right now at the end. So, my goodness. I'm going to give it oh, maybe again? about one more minute. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I okay. I guess I yeah. Wow. All right. Very popular. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, you're welcome, Montserrat. Okay. All right. So, all right. I'm gonna get started here. 
Um, so hello, everybody, um, and welcome. My name is Jamil Wilson, and I'm a virtual marine science intern at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems Exhibit. So welcome to our Marine Science in the Morning lecture series. Um, this series will highlight current marine science research presented by the researchers themselves. And this year we're featuring women in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This is an annual winter and spring series um, at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems Exhibit at the St. Lucie County Aquarium. Uh, normally this is an in-person program, but for obvious reasons this year it'll be uh, on a virtual platform. So information about and links to registration for upcoming programs is available on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Smithsonian SMS. All right, so yeah, while more people are joining, you can use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to let us know where you are right now. Um, and once again, thank you for popping up and, and supporting us. All right. Um, and as everybody joins the webinar, I'd like to point out some of the features as well. Um, you can use the Q&A box to ask your questions to our guests. Uh, the Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen and has two speech bubbles. You can submit a question at any time. Um, we will try to get to as many of them as possible at the end of our program. Um, and then there will also be another educator in the background to keep track of your questions. So if you see a message in the chat box, it will be coming from Aaron, um, who is an educator at our uh, Marine Station. So throughout the program, you can also use the chat box to send us messages and ask um, any questions about us. Um, and, you know, Maybe we can answer some questions for you. Um, your comments are visible only to Smithsonian staff, so please keep them on topic and appropriate, please. Um, so this webinar will be recorded and can be found on our Facebook and YouTube channel, um, which should be going up in the chat pretty soon. And yeah, all right, let's get started. So today on our program, we have Dr. Olivia Rhodes. Um, so today, Olivia will be speaking about her work with the Thalassia Experimental Network, which is an international partnership of 13 academic, nonprofit, government, and community partners in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean examining the effects of fishing pollution and climate change on seagrass ecosystem processes and functioning. This work focuses on the feeding behaviors of small and medium-sized fishes in these areas and how these behaviors vary in space and time across the network and why. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Olivia. Um, and yeah, feel free to Thank share you. your screen. <laughs> Thank you, Jamil. All right, let me share my screen. Okay. And we'll get going with this presentation. All right, um, thank you all for coming today. Really excited to be presenting to all of you. Um, so as Jamil said, uh, I'm gonna be focusing this presentation on a large network experiment in the Caribbean um, uh, called the Thalassi Experimental Network. And um, I'll tell you, I, I decided to tell you a lot about the larger project as well, because I think that's really important. But in terms of the results, uh, I'll be talking about this side project that I led as a, the postdoc of the network uh, for whom uh, the PI was Dr. Justin Campbell. Um, and I'll be focusing on this aspect of herbivory and predation in the seagrass beds that, that we were working in. And this picture in the background is a picture of me deploying some of the experiments uh, for this work um, via just free diving. So just holding my breath, swimming down and, and uh, deploying in this case, uh, seagrass, which is this uh, species I'll be telling you about a lot. It's a, an underwater grass. So um, uh, just uh, to give a plug to a recent article from the Smithsonian Magazine, which actually has pictures from our experiment, um, seagrasses provide really important ecosystem services to humans. 
And this is uh, an underwater grass, uh, uh, originally a land plant that recolonized the ocean. It's a true, uh, true flowering plant that lives underwater. Really important for a variety of services that it provides to people. Uh, and if you want to kind of check out more about this, I recommend looking at the December issue of the Smithsonian Magazine to read about this, uh, the, these prairies of the sea. And the types of, of services that these ecosystems provide, because they create these massive meadows underwater across the planet, are um, uh, food for really important uh, animals that we care about, like turtles and manatees. They actually eat different species of this grass. Uh, as well as habitat uh, for a lot of species that we really care about, both commercially uh, for food, um, as well as charismatically. So in this case, uh, Atlantic cod, also for snapper and grouper locally and in your region and um, uh, Florida, at least where this experiment was done. And then uh, also for queen conch, but uh, a variety of species rely on this um, beautiful ecosystem for habitat, for food. Uh, it also stabilizes shorelines and reduces the effects of storms for people and uh, sequesters carbon in certain cases, uh, large posidonia beds, for example, um, can um, retain old material and carbon for uh, thousands of years. Some of them even have um, old uh, ancient Roman artifacts in them from old uh, material buried deep uh, in, in their old root systems. So uh, unfortunately, as with many uh, ecosystems, seagrasses are threatened globally uh, by climate change. Uh, there are uh, changes in temperature are contributing, uh, for example, in this case, to severe defoliation of uh, seagrasses. This is an example from a marine heat wave or kind of a warming event in uh, Australia and uh, what, what happened to those uh, wire weed uh, seagrass uh, species in Shark Bay, Australia, um, but this is also happening elsewhere. Um, also, seagrasses are affected by local effects, uh, water pollution, which actually also contributed to those changes in Shark Bay, which clouds the water and prevents seagrass from being able to photosynthesize, and uh, herbivory. And in this case, as you can see, there's a, a large front of urchins that are coming through and consuming seagrass as well. Uh, this is happening uh, around the world again in, in some areas and even down in Florida where, where we were working at one of our sites, uh, one of these, these incidences of uh, urchin fronts coming through totally destroyed our experiment at the end in, in St. Joe's Bay, Florida. So you have a lot of these kind of different stressors affecting seagrasses. And uh, one of the most kind of up and coming things is uh, tropicalization of, of these herbivores uh, where warmer temperatures associated with climate change are shifting some of these uh, larger grazers called the macro grazers, uh, including urchins, uh, uh, as well as uh, fishes and other species northward and leading them to consume seagrasses more northern in their range and uh, potentially depleting those seagrass beds in conjunction with changes in temperature and uh, uh, additional nutrient effects and, and pollution in those areas. So, Locally in the Indian River Lagoon, and I was thinking this would be focused on the Smithsonian uh, Marine Station in Fort Pierce, uh, which is where the Indian River Lagoon presides, uh, are a bunch of different species of this grass. There's, there's actually uh, many different species worldwide. Uh, the one that we'll be focusing on is in the top left, the, the turtle grass. And this, uh, this species is... Um, really important for, uh, as you can imagine, turtles. It's consumed by turtles, but it, it, is, it occurs globally and it includes, in, included in this is, is um, 
uh, it spreads basically from the Gulf of Mexico down through the Southern Caribbean. So it has a very broad range in terms of its importance uh, for turtles, um, manatees in those areas, and then uh, also many fishes and invertebrates. So, and this, these, many of these species occur in other areas as well. So you may be familiar with, with Halidule, the shoal grass, with manatee grass here in Godium. Um, if you work, for example, in Florida or, or other areas uh, and um, areas of, of, of other oceans as well. So we considered this broader topic of tropicalization and changes in seagrass ecosystem function as a result of uh, temperature changes, uh, nutrient pollution and herbivory within the context of the Thalassia experimental network. And this was a network, as uh, Jamil had said, of 13 sites spanning the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean. It was uh, managed by lead PI, Dr. Justin Campbell, who is now at Florida International University, a professor. Uh, at the time that we started, he was based at the Smithsonian Marine Station in Fort Pierce, Florida. And um, these sites are, are um, span a, a range not only of, of 20 degrees in latitude, but also gradients in temperature and seasonality. Uh, as well as grazer abundance and grazing pressure with kind of um, increasing temperatures and stability in temperatures as you go further south toward the equator, which is pretty close to that most southern site in Panama. Um, and also generally thought to be increasing grazing pressure as you have many more of these grazers. But um, as you'll see that that's not actually necessarily the case in terms of that gradient in grazing. Uh, and just to give you an idea of the range of these sites, we have all the way from Bermuda in the north to sites in Florida and Texas, uh, parts of the Bahamas, um, Little Cayman Island here, Belize, uh, or no, Mexico, excuse me, um, Belize, uh, Bonaire, and uh, down in, in Panama. So we have this kind of full range range of sites uh, across these different areas that uh, really span not only latitude, but also a variety of different factors, which turned out to be quite interesting. Um, so the aim of this project, there were three aims. To first, to look at uh, the composition and, and feeding of grazers and other consumers in the network and how this varied across latitude and sites. Uh, looking at the effects of increased grazing on the structure and function of seagrasses, which might happen with tropicalization, and does this vary across gradients in latitude and temperature. And then finally, looking at how nutrient availability and pollution, uh, so enough, you know, some nutrients or too much may regulate uh, seagrass plant productivity and their response to herbivore grazing, because grazers are going to prefer more nutrient enriched grasses. And for this, sorry, for this presentation, uh, we're going to be focusing on that first question here. Um, but uh, the experimental design was focused, oh, sorry, this is the for the broader project. Um, at each of these sites, we had a deployment of 50 cages with different treatments associated with them. So this was actually the, the map that we would take down with us underwater on underwater paper to, to look at, well, first to design and deploy the array, each of these different boxes as a cage, and then to implement different treatments for them of uh, a couple of different things. So caging in certain cases to exclude herbivores versus no cages to allow herbivores to enter. Clipping, which is indicated by these little scissors uh, to simulate different types of grazers. And I'll tell you more about these treatments in a minute. And then fertilizer is indicated in the green to simulate high nutrient conditions versus not. So, uh, and as you can see, there's the different treatments down at the bottom. The array wasn't huge. I mean, these are half meter by half meter by half meter cages. So it took a space up of about 
uh, 11 to 23 meters. Um, and each of these, you can consider them like their own little garden plot. Uh, separated from one another, we cut the rhizomes or the root systems around to kind of separate each plot. So it's considered what we call a replicate. And, uh, and then have duplications of the different treatments so that we can see if this varies kind of within the site. And this was deployed at each of the 13 sites and maintained for a whole year. Uh, and we sampled it at two time periods in the fall and spring to see how results differed kind of after six months and after then a full year. So this was really a huge effort for these sites, um, cleaning the cages every couple of weeks, uh, you know, implementing everything in the first place, which, which we supported them in, and uh, sampling all of the plots, maintaining the treatments in terms of clipping and replacing uh, nutrients um, and maintaining cages that might have ripped or broken uh, and, and keeping track of the whole thing and doing kind of additional assays on top of this, which is part of what I'll be talking about. So this was really a huge effort. Uh, it was, a, 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 you know, over 50 people were involved in uh, just the deployment of things alone. And the papers that come from this in terms of scientific publications are really huge collaborative efforts. So the herbivore exclusions were really important in terms of uh, having this kind of fine mesh that we set up uh, to exclude both the mega grazers. So that would be turtles and other things and manatees and I'm not sure if I answer these questions now or at the end, um, but for now I'm gonna I'm gonna leave them in the chat. Um, down to uh, smaller things like actually large fishes. So uh, a completed cage is on the bottom right. This is our our site partner uh, Bridget Van Tessenbrook in uh, Mexico who works at UNAM is a professor. Uh, she was assisting us with setting up at that site. Uh, and this is one of those completed cages underwater. So as you can see, it has a lid and all four sides uh, to keep everything out. There were other cages that we call controls for caging because they have some shading effects on the grass. Uh, so they had three sides and a lid uh, that's still allowed in herbivores, but then would um, allow us to look at what the effects of just the shading would be, and then no cages, which just had the four poles on the outside. So those different treatments for the herbivore exclusions. A simulated herbivore grazing treatment, uh, a mega grazer like turtles or manatees, where we clipped the grass quite low to the ground with just a couple centimeters of seagrass height remaining, and then a simulated um, a kind of macro grazer, like a, a, a fish or uh, parrot fishes are, are really common, for example, feeders on seagrass. And those vary from really tiny little guys all the way up to parrot fishes that are actually quite large that take pretty large bites from the seagrass. So we had this kind of additional clipping treatment where literally people went around with little scissors to clip the grass. And then finally, this fertilizer treatment to simulate nutrient additions, which was uh, osmocyte fer fertilizer placed in a bag uh, around the center pole um, uh, in some treatments, and then a center pole, but no bag of fertilizer added to others. And just to give you an idea of what one of the arrays looks like, hop in here so you can see, Let's see if it'll... Sorry, it's a little bit bumpy here, but that's just showing you kind of how a cage would have looked underwater. Um, and we go around to look at some of the other cages as well. So that's, this was as we were setting up, um, getting things going. And this is what it would be like swimming around as a, as a diver to, to set up these different cages. These don't have lids quite yet. So um, we're still setting up, um, but they were also all labeled so you could keep track of which was which. Of course, that's some of the material. We're still kind of setting up the cages in the background. Anyway, just to give you a sense of kind of how this looked, there's the caging material uh, underwater. So 
as a, as I mentioned, um, we were really focusing on this first, uh, I, for this presentation, will be focusing on this first question because alongside all of this, and uh, this is almost a teaser because it would be great if at some point um, Dr. Campbell or um, myself could uh, uh, could come back and give the a follow-up to actually the results from uh, the experimental network itself, because it is such a huge effort. We're in the process of data analysis and uh, we'll be coming out with some really interesting results regarding seagrass characteristics across the network and uh, the effects of all of those different treatments, which varied by site and also across latitude. Um, but we're still in the process of doing that. It's been a huge effort uh, in involving lots of additional uh, sam uh, sampling processing of the seagrass as well as of the data that we collected. So um, that's kind of a teaser for, for what's to come with that experiment and you're welcome to contact me regarding that. But we're really gonna focus on a side project that I did uh, looking at natural grazing and the herbivore community and how that varied across the network, and also how uh, predation varied across the network. So kind of these larger consumers. So um, kind of consistent in all of this is not only considering the effects of some of these, uh, of, of the treatments that we have added into the system, but also considering what are the ecosystem processes or predation and herbivory, and how are those varying across the network as well. So the way that we uh, we did this was I, I, uh, I did this as a side project uh, at a selection of the sites, um, some of which I deployed myself and some of which the site partners uh, deployed themselves. Uh, 10 of the sites were actually involved in this. They're all highlighted in orange. They deployed this side project of tethering assays. Um, spanning all the way from the north. And actually, I've just found out that, that our um, Bermuda site deployed this as well. So I'm going to be adding in their data as well. Um, so uh, this involved doing what we call tethering assays. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So um, let's see here. Basically, what you set up in, in this particular case and, and the purpose of it is to look at, in this case, grazing rates underwater, natural grazing rates. And you could go under and you could count little bites on the seagrass from consumers eating the grass. But another way that you can do it to measure it kind of quantitatively in space in a manipulative experiment where we add in things underwater to see what's happening is to put in these little units, tying the seagrass within it and then securing it to the seafloor uh, with, with garden stakes on a little sizzle rope. And to deploy kind of a selection of these units at various places and at various times at the sites underwater. And then uh, ultimately it's really useful to set up an underwater camera. In this place we, uh, we use um, GoPros, which are very cheap underwater cameras that can film what's happening. And you deploy these these standardized assays with seagrass, uh, in this case, we stuck three little pieces in each unit of 10 centimeters long. And then you come back after a given amount of time, in this case, we did 24 hours to see if, if any animals have eaten the grass. Now you're gonna see pretty low grazing light rates because this entire area is actually surrounded by seagrass as well. So, um, but you're picking really palatable seagrass uh, so that the fishes will be more tempted to come. And, uh, and then you can measure grazing, relative grazing across the sites to get a metric of grazing intensity across the network. Let's see. Um, similarly, to look at larger consumption rates, and, and you could call this a feeding rates by uh, smaller benthic carnivores or mesopredators. <clears throat> we also, in this case, you can tether live animals like, you know, little crabs or um, snails or other things, but to 
encompass all of the different consumers that live across the whole network and not to bias because the prey differ across the network to not bias toward any particular site. We deploy a standard assay with, in this case, squid. And this was bait, squid, uh, frozen. We had frozen squid, but then also dried squid um, to do this standard assay across the network as well. And in this case, you place a garden stake uh, in the water with a little uh, loop and an attached piece of squid at the end. I deploy them at two heights in the water column. Uh, and then you deploy an, uh, a kind of an assemblage of these again with a camera. And you can look at relative feeding rates across the different sites as well. And a number of different critters will come. These can range from kind of <clears throat> smaller you know, trunk fishes to snappers uh, and parrot, or sorry, not parrot fishes, um, puffer fishes. Sorry, this is the trunk fish. Um, a lot of different things will come and feed. Um, and it's kind of a general met metric of consumer pressure. So just to give you the full experimental design, we deployed these types of tethering assays, either the seagrass or these predation assays at the 10 of the 13 original 10 sites across 20 degrees of latitude. Uh, we deployed these tethering assays with both seagrass and squid at many places, conducted these fish surveys monthly simultaneously with uh, the, <clears throat> the deployment of the assays so we could see what the general community looked like. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about this too. And then also deployed temperature loggers and other uh, loggers uh, to look at environmental variables, both in terms of temperature and light at the sites, but also many seagrass characteristics, which we had actually sampled, uh, which I can use as covariates in, um, in the analyses as well. And we did these deployments during, a, well, between one and four seasons. So through, throughout the duration of the Thalassia Experimental Network experiment from uh, summer of 2018 through fall, winter, and finally in spring of 2019. So first let's consider grazing on seagrass. And this is actually of all the videos that we deployed at all the sites, we only captured one video of actual grazing. This was by a bucktooth parrotfish. And I'll, I'll play it for you twice. And I'm, it's, it's a little bit, sorry, it's a little bit um, uh, stunted here, but this is your fish, blends perfectly into the grass. It's a very short video, so I'll play it for you again so you can see it coming up. Here's the fish, takes a bite from the grass and kind of floats around and actually looks a bit like a piece of grass itself. Um, so, so this was really important because we couldn't actually use video evidence to determine the grazers. We had to use evidence from actually looking at the grass. And this has been pretty well uh, established that uh, before deployment, these are what your shoots are going to look like when you deploy them. And afterward, you're going to see from fishes these little tiny bite marks. And other uh, herbivores are present, turtles, which would chomp off you know, much larger sections and, and a little bit more cleanly, urchins, which might tear off sections as well. So there's evidence from different grazers, but for the purposes of this study, we were really focusing on one of the main um, uh, grazers, the fish grazers, which always take these little bites that are very visible. So all of our evidence is based off of those and any uh, grazers that are, are known to be seagrass grazers in those areas. All right. Now in terms of some of the squid predation, this is on the frozen squid that we deployed. Uh, that's a, a yellowtail snapper that's coming in to feed at, at one of these longer garden stakes with the squid attached. It was at multiple heights, but you can see the ones best at the top. And this was at our little Cayman site. And then finally, actually I actually have a few more just to give you kind of an idea of what this looks like. This is a lane snapper that came in. Um, and you can see the fish feed differently. Some of them sample a little bit more like that yellowtail snapper did. 
um, this lane snapper really just buzzed in and fed really quickly and left. I'm sorry, these are a little jumpy videos. I think it's because I have so many included in here. Um, and then this is a, a trunk fish from our Bahamas, uh, the Eleuthera site in the Bahamas, uh, consuming the dried squid. So um, you get a kind of a, an idea of the different types of feeders that you're actually seeing here. There's a huge assemblage um, but first, let's go into the composition of species that we noticed across latitude. So I had estimated consumer composition using these monthly fish surveys that we conducted underwater. And in particular, I was really interested in the abundance of different what we call functional feeding groups, uh, both the grazers, but also the benthic carnivores, which are the major species that would have been consuming the grass. And then also piscivores, which would be eating both of those species. So uh, on the left here, we have the, the survey sites ordered from highest latitude to lowest latitude and the relative abundance of seagrass grazers at these sites. So basically the proportion of species accounted for by seagrass grazers of all the species observed and unlike what we might expect, which would have been simply this uh, latitudinal increase in grazers at lower latitudes, we actually have so very few grazers at these higher latitude sites, but then this kind of interesting hump shaped pattern, um, which is, is really interesting. Uh, now there are only 10 sites, but again, we're looking at regional patterns here and we're really not seeing that latitudinal gradient uh, that we would have expected. Um, a monotonic increase, which would mean kind of a gradual increase uh, with, with uh, decreasing latitude. Uh, similarly, we're actually not seeing necessarily strong patterns in uh, with the same sites oriented from uh, the northernmost to southernmost sites from highest to lowest latitude, the relative uh, abundance of, of benthic carnivores we're, we're not seeing a monotonic decrease in those either, uh, as we might expect. We're seeing kind of some strong site variation, maybe a general decrease, but then uh, not necessarily at certain sites. Similarly, if we consider these piscivores, which again, diversity is thought to kind of, and, and abundance is often thought to increase at lower latitudes, we're really not seeing necessarily a monotonic increase, although it does look like there's a kind of low abundances of these piscivores at the high latitude sites and a general increase with one exception at the lower latitude sites. And, and these are the piscivores in this case, like barracuda and mutton snapper and uh, spotted sea trout that would be eating a lot of those grazers and benthic carnivores that, uh, for which we're measuring the feeding rates. So the first thing to note here is simply that uh, consumer composition does not necessarily vary uh, predictably with latitude and in ways that we might have expected. And instead, there's a lot of site variation that's, that's contributing to this. And particularly for these grazers, this kind of hump-shaped pattern, uh, which could be related to things other than temperature, uh, potentially fishing pressure or other local factors. Uh, seagrass complexity that, that could be contributing to that. So uh, actually taking a look at the, gra at the grazing assays, or in this case, the, um, the consumer assays for which we deployed squid, we did, we were able to analyze that video and record a total of about 30% of all the recorded feeding events. And these were all the feeders that we identified, which ranged from puffer fish to snappers, uh, like you saw in the video, uh, grunts, trigger fishes, uh, trunk fish, as you also saw in the video, um, really a whole range of species all the way down to hardhead catfish in this lane snapper, which you also observed, and one green sea turtle, which seemed to like the squid as well. Um, they can sometimes be, uh, often be omnivorous at, at younger life stages. So um, these species were the ones that were identified as feeders. And if we look at kind of, this is the proportion of bait that each of them consumed. Uh, and um, 
the one interesting note is that everything that is starred was eating more than we would expect simply based off of their abundance, which I think is actually literally everything there. <laughs> so these were eating, uh, the, you know, a lot uh, compared to their actual abundance in the area. And they really span from piscivores, shown in the darkest uh, in black, uh, to invertivores and omnivores in kind of medium and lighter gray, uh, to this, of course, one seagrass grazer, uh, the turtle. But really the predominant feeders are these benthic carnivores. So what we're really looking at with this feeding rates are uh, consumer pressure by these benthic carnivores. Now, uh, kind of reflecting on what we saw before uh, in terms of the composition of the consumers, the feeding rates by these consumers also don't vary monotonically or predictably with latitude. So again, we have our sites organized from highest to lowest latitude and uh, the grazing rates on the x-axis, and these are seagrass bites per minute, very slow grazing rates. Again, we have really these kind of strong site level patterns with a few sites that show much higher grazing rates, although there's a great deal of variation around that pattern. And a lot of sites that have that have fairly low grazing rates and some that have no grazing at all. So that would be Crystal and Naples. Um, so not again, a monotonic increase in grazer pressure as we might've expected from uh, the literature at these subtropical to tropical sites. Similarly, with feeding rates on squid per minute, uh, a selection of the sites, we had fewer uh, predation assays than we did grazing assays. And looking at these feeding rates by uh, site, you see much, much higher feeding rates in this instance at the higher latitude sites relative to these lower latitude sites. So there is some type of a, a, a high latitude effect here, although um, it's, it's not again, monotonic, it doesn't decrease sequentially with latitude. So again, you have potentially strong side effects with both the feeding rates as well as those grazing rates on the seagrass. And when we looked at some of the, the patterns that might be influencing this, so we know latitude clearly isn't one of those because you don't see these strong uh, patterns, at least for grazing rates. There were important effects of seasonal differences. So uh, if we look at grazing rates, in this case on the y-axis, by the different seasons from summer, fall to winter and spring, you see a decline in feeding rates from the beginning of the experiment, which is the warmest time down to the, the end of the experiment, um, which was much, much cooler. And some of this could be temperature some of it could also be the composition of species, which changes over time, although that's not something that we have enough uh, data to actually show. And then one other interesting thing to notice is that the feeding rates, uh, so on the squid, uh, by latitude, but then separated by season, we deployed them during three seasons, are much stronger for the fall and the spring relative to the winter time. So again, there could be something going on here with temperature in terms of that these higher latitude sites may have higher feeding rates in the fall when temperature is warm, but also may be related to the presence of animals which kind of shift in and out of the seagrass depending on the season. So you're seeing these strong seasonality effects um, and I'm not gonna go into these models, but all of these models uh, are what we call mixed effects models, taking into account kind of the design of the experiment, the nested design with uh, assays deployed within each site over time, and then accounting for some of these variables uh, within, uh, within each of those sites. So seasonality, and then we're gonna talk about a couple of these others in a minute. And, and in uh, for predation rates latitude. Um, so we don't, we see these strong relationships with seasonality, not really with latitude, um, but we also see relationships with local site characteristics given, uh, which actually makes sense given what we were seeing with that kind of 
looking at the site level variation in grazing and uh, feeding rates or predation rates by latitude. And in fact, when we take into account consumer composition and specifically the presence of piscivores across sites, we see that uh, the grazing rate on the y-axis decreases with piscivore presence. Uh, uh, so you see this potential kind of scaring effect of piscivores on grazers uh, if, if we consider these as kind of site level patterns. So um, again, this was a presence or absence of piscivores at these different sites. Um, which, as we noted, were there were higher abundances or presence of those at lower latitude sites generally. Um, and then in terms of other local site characteristics, we'd also measured seagrass characteristics and one that turned out to actually be really important, which is kind of unusual, was variation in the canopy heights. So this was variation in the, the height of the maximum shoot from the lowest to the highest. So if you saw, you know, all seagrass was the same height, it would be very low. If all seagrass was a different height, then um, that would be very, uh, a much larger number. And you actually see that these feeding rates on squid on the y-axis tend to increase with variation in canopy height. So there's some element of this complexity or variation height that is also contributing to these higher feeding rates. And then finally, habitat complexity, the interaction effect of the seagrass height variability and the effect of piscivores. So if we separate out and look at grazing rates on the y-axis as a function of piscivore presence on the x-axis, but we parse this out by low, mo low to moderate, moderate to high and high seagrass height variability, you see different relationships with the presence of piscivores. So if you have low complexity, you see a decline in feeding rates um, with the presence of piscivores. But if you have high complexity, you see no to potentially increasing trends in um, feeding rates and in grazing rates with seagrass height variability. So there's just a lot of different uh, relationships here, you might see an opposite pattern with piscivore presence if you can if you consider higher numbers of uh, or higher uh, variability in the seagrass. So there's some element of complexity that might be actually protecting those grazers as they're feeding from the presence of piscivores, or at least behaviorally appearing to do so. So just to give you an idea of what this could kind of look like, because it actually occurred both for the grazers and for the consumers, the benthic carnivores, here's that same trunk fish feeding and then um, very quick disappearance because a much larger piscivore and carnivore, this is a reef shark, is, uh, is coming to check out the scene. And one really interesting thing about this is that this can actually be mediated, this variation in seagrass height, uh, and there's a lot of old literature that shows this, can actually be mediated by seagrass complexity. So uh, these mega grazers like the turtles, also the manatees, can create kind of differences in the height of the seagrass, which could contribute to kind of creating this variation that then may support smaller grazers in hiding from piscivore predators. So that's just something that um, we're speculating about. It is shown in the past literature, but it, it is kind of interesting to consider. And this was a shot and, and the photo credit, sorry, this is uh, the same gentleman who did the pictures for the Smithsonian article, took this picture of our experimental array at one of the sites which had particularly high seagrass grazing that was actually in the northern latitudes. So again, this seagrass grazer 
uh, the seagrass complexity and the abundance of even these mega grazers doesn't increase monoton or decrease monotonically with latitude. You actually had some of these major large, large grazers at some of the northern sites um, that also might be then contributing to these kind of interactive effects of seagrass complexity and um, uh, piscivore presence on consumption or and feeding rates, uh, both on seagrass and then also on, on natural consumers. So uh, I kept this pretty short since uh, just to give us a little bit more time for questions. So um, with that, I wanted to acknowledge all of the people who were involved in this. And I apologize if, if I forgot someone, this is a very long list of people, uh, in, which included a number of site partners, um, postdocs, interns, which included undergraduates, post undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, really the whole gamut. Um, federal employees, you know, there were academics on this project, but also uh, nonprofit organizations and um, uh, government employees and local community members. So this really was a huge uh, village effort across regions or across the region. Uh, a huge uh, shout out to the Smithsonian Marine Station, which really mobilized as a community to support all of this work. Everyone at this, I don't think a single person at the station didn't help. <laughs> uh, everybody helped and, and were incredibly wonderful about it. Uh, and then we also had a lot of support at the sites from uh, dive support and boating support to uh, folks that orchestrated, you know, working at the marine labs in the different areas and, and making our field work possible to, again, local community members and scient other scientists at uh, supporting from the universities. So really this huge, huge collaborative effort and, and we're really grateful for that. Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me after this at the email address I've provided. And I also have a not very good needed to be updated, but I figured I'd share it um, a WordPress page as well. And with that, I will take any questions. All right, there. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rhodes, for that super awesome presentation. Um, I know you're short on time because I know you have, to, you have to go at 12. So I'll kind of ask some of these questions and combine them a little bit if I can. Um, but a lot of the questions that we had um, were concerning outside factors and how that could affect the research. Um, so one of the questions was about um, how does pollution affect the seagrass and littering, um, as well as like boat gas, um, would that have any like adverse effects on the research that you guys were doing? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. So uh, a bigger thing than, well, I'm boat gas has its own uh, lethal effects on seagrass and the animals in the grass. Um, but even potentially more so in some of these areas is boat uh, scars. So uh, prop scars, um, people who leave their, their um, motors, their engines down low in the water, the propellers create massive scars uh, in the seagrass bed, which are super detrimental in breaking up apart and, and what we call fragmenting the habitat of seagrass. So that's something that's actually, that is really important, uh, particularly in the Gulf and a lot of work has been done on, on the negative effects of that on the grass, but also on the animals that live in it. Um, pollution, yes, is hugely important. So it, where I was working in Florida, this was really one of the primary concerns because we were supposed to have a site in the Indian River Lagoon at the Smithsonian, near the Smithsonian Marine Station, but uh, we couldn't put it in because there wasn't enough seagrass anymore. And this is thought to be due to, uh, uh, basically there's uh, discharges from some of the major lakes in Florida into the Indian River Lagoon, which uh, make the water incredibly dark and murky in the summertime. Uh, and, and I think also at other seasons, it depends on um, kind of when they need to flood the river because uh, it depends on agriculture. But 
those pulses of water, and then also just local development, shoreline development, and runoff from people's lawns and uh, fertilizers and, and things like that, and stormwater runoff, all have largely contributed to huge declines in seagrass in, in the Indian River Lagoon. So there are these really important local side effects that, yes, uh, for example, in those areas can contribute to um, declines in the grass. We were working in really pretty pristine sites, a lot of these, but one of them that has been affected was actually the Eleuthera site where there's been a lot of development of the shoreline right around with people building large homes and people had been concerned, uh, locals had, had visited a talk there and were concerned that again, runoff from fertilizer from local homes was contributing to local declines there. Um, so yes, definitely a huge problem. Not something we were looking at directly with this study, except with the potential addition of nutrient effects, which uh, when you, uh, and I didn't show any pictures from this, but from, uh, from the plots, you could see anywhere from positive nutrient effects at areas, because this whole gradient, there's also a gradient in nutrient availability. It's generally higher at Northern latitude sites and lower at lower latitude sites. Um, but down at the southernmost site, which is Bocas del Toro in Panama, there are, it's, it's high nutrients because it's a very locally developed area. And so the addition of nutrients there just totally killed off the grass and resulted in algal growth kind of all throughout um, versus at some of the, some of the central sites, which were low nutrient, uh, either phosphorus or nitrogen sites it actually bolstered the grass and um, made it much more, um, more healthy and, and uh, just nutrient enriched and which can have positive effects, but then it can actually also increase grazing pressure because grazers find it to be more tasty once it, once it has more nutrients. So that happened, for example, at Little Cayman, which is a, a nutrient poor site. Well, thank you for answering uh, answering our question on that. Sure. Um, another question that we had was basically about um, the researchers free diving. So, mm. did they free dive, or did they need to use scuba gear to collect that? Um, basically, collect the the data, and also um, a side part: um, if there was a there was a question about why the fish, I guess, nibbled on the darker parts of the seagrass rather than the green parts. If that was, I don't know, a factor um, at all. Or, I don't know. Oh, I don't know if I, I, <laughs> I might have misspoken there. It's it should it's all so you pick the nicest parts of the grass, which are all bright green. So they would have generally eaten the tastiest bright green grass. Uh, oh. There is there are actually some species that will only eat the epiphytes, the little things that grow on the grass, and they will mm -hmm. selectively just nibble the tips. But we're mostly looking at things that are actually eating the, the grass for the seagrass uh, nutrient content. Um, in terms of free diving versus scuba, that's a great question. So it really varied by site. We mostly worked on scuba for deploying all the experiments at all the sites. But some sites didn't have that capacity to maintain that throughout experimental kind of maintenance for the whole year. And so they did uh, free diving for all the maintenances when we were not there. Uh, Crystal River was one of those. They had a large team of folks at University of Florida that they gathered together to do it all via free diving. Um, Eleuthera was another one of those sites. And again, our partners there at the Center for Ocean Research and Education uh, were uh, uh, Owen O'Shea brought out this massive team of, of local community members and students who all did uh, assisted with the project and did it all free diving. So that was a really impressive kind of effort on both of their those sites parts to to do this without scuba because a lot of this is very shallow. It's you know within ten feet of the surface. All of my assays. Let's see, actually, no, even the assays were a mix. I love free diving. So I can easily deploy things free diving if I want. If, uh, you know, if there's um, a necessity, I can also do it 
scuba diving. It really just depended logistically. So the first picture that you saw was me free diving. Later in here, though, see in this picture that um, that gentleman is scuba diving to clean. So again, variable, but kind of you with these types of um, scientific projects, you kind of do what 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 works and um, and roll with it. Right. I'm guessing free diving was a lot less cumbersome. So it is definitely. <laughs> but a lot of this takes I mean, cleaning these cages would take hours and hours. So I spent many dives and I had over almost 300 dives for this project, oh. just maintaining the experiment over a year. Uh, six hours underwater, I would be underwater at a time, uh, sometimes longer. So long periods of time. Uh, and and so free diving, it's a, it's a huge physical effort. You need a lot more people that can kind of you know, many hands make light work versus it would be a couple scuba divers that would do it all. So. Um, I know we're almost pretty much out of time. I'm gonna ask one more question, um, just if you can. Answer oh, absolutely. I'm, and <laughs> one minute over is fine if there's a couple more that that look. That we can get to. Um, there were some folks that wanted to know specifically what the cages were used for, if they were used to like necessarily separate different um, controls or, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So <laughs> primarily they were for herbivore exclusion. So it was to keep out the big turtles and also the smaller fishes. It was, they were really most effective at keeping out the turtles. And this ended up being really important at this site, for example, where these turtles really took to grazing around the cages. And also the Bermuda site with really high turtle populations where they deployed the experiment in one of the only remaining um, healthy seagrass beds in, in, um, in Bermuda because there's been kind of an explosion of sea turtles, the loss of top uh, shark predators that has actually contributed to overgrazing and uh, explosion of these turtle populations, which are actually endangered, but are now not being regulated by predators that have been overfished. Yeah. So yeah, mostly the, the per I mean, the, primarily the purpose was exclusion of, of these herbivores. Right, making sure that, you know, the right things are being affected. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, thank you so much. I know we're like out of time. You have to go at 12. Um, but thank you for sharing your time with us, Dr. Rhodes. We really appreciate it. And I hope everybody enjoyed. Um, keep up to date with what's happening by following us on social media. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash Smithsonian SMS. Um, and our YouTube page is youtube.com slash Smithsonian SMS the same. So yes, thank you so much. And yeah, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and we'll get up later. Yep. And feel free to contact me again if anybody has additional questions or if you're looking for that virtual lab that I put together, please feel free to contact me at my email address um, or on my on my web page. All right. Thanks well, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Take care. Bye.